What follows will not be broadcast in its present form. None of the material has received official clearance. This is a trial record only. Sealing unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio program is brought to you by Lockheed Vega. Sealing unlimited. Turret. Rear gunner. Hey, you guys. Navigator to pilot. I'm at the waste guns. Where are the others? Blacked out. Oxygen line poked out. Hey! This is crazy beginning to look like a piece of lace. Yeah. I'd sure hate to get caught in the rain now. Left rudder! How do you like that, Sukiyaki? Discouraging, ain't it? As it turned back on its homeward journey, a running fight between the bomber and 18 Jap pursuit planes continued for 75 miles. Four ships attacked from each side and were shot down with the side guns. The radio operator was killed, the engineer's right hand was shot off, one gunner was crippled, leaving only one man to operate both side guns. Although wounded, he kept firing, bringing down three more zeros. While this was going on, one engine went dead, another was shot out, one gas tank was hit, windshield smashed, the radio was shot off, the oxygen system entirely destroyed. Out of 11 control cables, all but four were shot away. The rear landing wheel was blown off. Two front wheels were both shot flat. Two shells left gaping holes in the wing and part of the tail was shot off. But it landed on its own airfield, under its own power at night, broken, crippled, but safe. And it would fly again. This is a true story, and there are many like it. That's the story of an American plane that got home. It's called a flying fortress. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have an all-star cast. Introducing Snoozy, Cactus Sal, Rose O'Day, Dry Martini, Birmingham Blitzkrieg, Johnny Reb, and Big Punk. Flying men like their planes too well not to name them. Ever hear of a boat or a horse without a name? Rattler, Phyllis, Baby Doll, Berlin Sleeper, Big Stuff, Alexander the Swoos, all flying fortresses. That last name is a little confusing, Alexander the Swoose. A swoose is a cross between a swan and a goose. Just a pet name because a flying fortress is just what it sounds like. A fortress that flies. Am I right? They can't shoot our fortresses out of the air. And brother, they've tried to. We're out riding the best pursuit ships they've got. We come home with a thousand holes, but we come home. She's built like the Brooklyn Bridge. We brought down 13 Nazi fighters over ruin without losing a plane. Say, we've got Garing so nervous he's eating his medals. Those boys ought to know. They're the flight crew talking. They're over the target day and night, fighting fog and fire, riding the murderous sky, slugging it out with the best Hitler and Hirohito have to offer. We can take their word for it. Their testimonials are signed in blood. And did you hear the flying Ford crew who came riding in on the tail assembly? Yeah, the rest of it was shot away. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we want you to get acquainted with a flying fortress. It's your plane, and it's a great plane. You're paying for it. Your sons and husbands are flying it. This is your personal war. You win or you lose, each of you. You're therefore requested to listen. The roots of aviation lead back to poetry and legend and dreamers. The first man to truly experiment on the theory of flight was Leonardo da Vinci, painter, philosopher, scientist, and inventor of the 16th century. He is the man who succeeded in all things but failed in one, to build a machine that would enable man to fly like a bird. Next we come... Excuse me, Mr. Wells. Yes? I don't think I'm given quite the credit I deserve. If we'd had engines in the 16th century, my airplane would have worked. Leonardo da Vinci. What are you doing at the Lockheed Vega airfield in California? Well, you see, Mr. Wells, out there in limbo, I can't sleep nights hearing those flying fortresses roar by. I decided to come down and see what the century is up to in aviation. You've come to the right place, Leonardo. I'd be delighted to show you around. We've made some improvements on your models. May I introduce... Rose O'Day. She's a big girl, isn't she? Ready to go places without an escort, too. Yes, Rose O'Day can take care of herself very well. 
We'd like you to meet the organized miracle of a motor, Mr. Da Vinci. The timing, the pistons hot in the cylinders, the valves, the wrist pins, the stroke, the bore, the crankshaft, the counterweight, the magneto spark plugs, gas lines, oil fields, filters, superchargers, and the thousand tiny parts down to bolts and nuts and cotter pins. How does she sound, Mr. Da Vinci? There's a lot of horsepower pulling at the bit. Thousands of horses coiled in the tight cylinders, ready to roar down the roadway of the sky. Let's hear it! Have we put enough life into your mechanical dream, Mr. Da Vinci? We've given your bird a great heart, and we've given her claws, too. Machine guns and cannons. That's the Roseau Day. That goes for the others. All the others. Proud in their sky. We built this murderous, beautiful plane, Mr. Da Vinci. Because we're fighting for our life. We're at war, and we've got to win. If you recall, Mr. Wells, in my own experiments with war machines, I laid great stress on armor. Well, she's got that, too. Armor plate, and she can go 300 miles an hour and better. 35,000 feet. She can drop her bombs in a smokestack. It sounds unbelievable. And the enemy learned to believe it the hard way. They learned to believe the 103-foot wing spread and 73-foot length and 16-foot tail height. About 30,000 separate parts would go into a fortress. Three and a half miles of wiring and lots of rubber. Are you listening in, Adolf? I'll take it all down. If you're waiting for the bomb site figures or production figures, you won't get them. We can give you a hint, though. Pencil ready? Rate of production on this plane has increased 300% since Pearl Harbor. <whistles> that hurt, didn't it? Well, put that in your pipe and choke on it. The rest is no military secret. You read the communiques, or should we refresh your memory a bit? Rouen. Railroad yards demolished. Aveville. Wrecked aerodrome. Over North Sea. Battled off 20 Nazi fighters. Shot down six. No losses. Amiens. 15 direct hits on yards. Rotterdam. Shipyards blasted. Moat. Demolished aircraft factory. One fort down 13 fighters. Loss up to September 6th. Two fortresses. All precision bombing at high altitude. 10 to 20,000 feet. Scientific, Mr. Da Vinci. And very deadly. An old American custom. And that's not counting the Pacific area. The flying fort that carried MacArthur out of the Philippines. Colin Kelly sank to Aruna with a flying fort. There's New Guinea in the Battle of Midway, where 30 fortresses help scatter a Jap invasion fleet, and the Solomons. Yes, they're writing history in the sky, and don't think the Axis doesn't know it. Wir müssen ein für alle Mal unser deutsches Vaterland sicher machen gegen diese kleinen Fortschritts. Flying fortress. Non ci sarà riposo per l'impero italiano finché gli italiani non sapranno distruggere the flying fortress. Yes, it's on their mind, day and night. They're worried. They've seen it, heard it, tasted it. Over Rouen, Cherbourg, Abbeville, Dieppe, Havre, Utrecht, Rotterdam, Bremen, Augsburg, Buna, Rabul, and he points east, west, north, south. They didn't get much sleep this past summer. They're gonna get less from now on. It'll be one long daylight of hell. It'll be another deep, only a real one this time, one way. And the forts will be up there like an umbrella. Hey, uh, hey, just a minute. Uh, where's your visiting bag? Oh, right in my pocket. Oh, well, you'd better wear them on the outside, both of you. It's healthier. Your first visit inside the plant? That's right. Oh, are you interested in statistics? Oh, very much. Uh, if I may ask, Oh, what about the tools? Oh, you beat me to that $64 question. I was just going to talk about tools. You know, it takes over 200,000 tools to build a flying fortress. 200,000? Mm -hmm. Are there that many? Well, if there isn't, we make them. If we had more time, we'd teach the fortress how to talk. Just look over there. A wing jig three stories high, one unit, and here in my hand, 1,000 units. This little grommet is so small, you can lose it under a fingernail. Look, I've got a thousand of them in my hand. Mm, truly an amazing spectacle, this assembly line. Just an American way of getting things done quickly, Mr. Da Vinci. We did it with the automobiles, now we're doing it with the planes. 24-hour shift, men and women working like bees, joining the plane together unit by unit. Then the motors are miraculously hoisted down, set in place. Quickly, quickly, the hands seem to say, let's put it together quickly, we're fighting time. 
They need this plane somewhere. They need our work. They need our skill, our hands. We understand without whips, without fear or panic. We understand as free men do. Your plane is ready, Mr. Wells. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Da Vinci, would you like to take a ride in the Flying Fortress? Mr. Wells, I've been waiting over 400 years for such an opportunity. <laughs> That's patience enough. We're delivering this one to England and point secret. You mean direct? From factory to front, with stopover, of course, to check gas, oil, and water and have the windshield clean. <laughs> I am ready. Good. First, let's meet the crew. Not all those men. Well, not quite. Eighteen of them are ground crew, bomb supply and mechanics who know their jobs and keep the plane in vitamin shape here in front of the flyers. Takes nine men to fly a fort, baseball team. Step out, boys, meet Mr. Da Vinci. Bombardier. I sit in a plastic glass nose with a secret bomb site and two machine guns, <laughs> just in case. I lay the eights, TNT. Navigator. I sit in back of the bombardier. I shoot the sun and stars and anything else that comes by. And you, sir? I'm the high man. I watch the instruments. I bring baby home, or what's left of her. I'm the co-pilot. If we're both out, she flies herself home. We hope. <laughs> Four of us take care of the center of the plane, more or less. Two radio men, two engineers. We also double on brass. You know, the kind bullets come in. Well, that leaves one more. I'm the tail gunner, way out in center field. What's your job? Well, I give him the kiss of death, I knock him down with all I got. Wonderful view back there, but lonely. Ready to go, Mr. Wells. Oh, thanks. Up the plank, Mr. Da Vinci. I'm a little suspicious about the center of gravity, but I, I guess she'll fly. Get into those parachutes, boys. Regulations. Okay. All set. We're moving, Mr. Wells. We're moving. We leave the ground. This huge monster of metal, heavier than a building rising with the ease and liberty of birds. The plane quivers, breaks with the earth. These thousand thundering horses gallop through the marvelous air, and we're free. We defy the sun and earth's friction. The motors beat like a giant single heart. Man has learned to control the sky. Man is at the helm of his century. Man can make assassins out of angels, so he may live in freedom. He is well armed. He is lightning, riding the air. He is the stroke of thunder. Eastward to the mountains, the Rockies, Nevada, Wyoming, straddling the Wasatch over the teeth of the Big Horn, the mighty ranges, into the latitude of timber toward the origin of rivers, then the brushwood, the green states, the golden states of wheat and corn, Nebraska, Iowa, eastward towards the city with their thunder of machines and the giant promises. Over the steel states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, over the coal and iron areas, over Holmes, Kansas, Missouri. This plane is for you, Illinois. Your steel is our wings. We fly for your protection. This fortress is the armor for your avenues. This plane is your promise to the free world. Virginia, Carolina, Dakota, Wisconsin. We fly over you. Take your greeting with us. Bring the name America to the burning lands. We bring the hope that name is. Over New England, over industry, past the 45th meridian and the white beachheads and the blue Atlantic beneath. Speed, speed onward into the night. Oh, flying fortress. Oh, living answer to the eyes of nations. They wait in England, in Africa, in China, in the heroic streets of Stalingrad. The free people wait and watch the sky for your coming. The people enslaved pray for your coming. Fly well. Honor to your wings, your motor. Honor to the hands which built you, the workers, the men and women. Honor to our allies who receive these. Honors to the brave airmen who ride daily into battle, who perish in flame and water. Honor to the pioneers of the air, the dreamers, the builders. Honor to all, and victory. Dream new designs and perfect them. Sweat over drawing boards. Build and rebuild. Work months, years, even decades to improve single models. 
That's how America's great aircraft makers got their know-how, the creative ability that is a vital big gun in this nation's arsenal today. For there's no ersatz for know-how, no shortcut, no mathematical formula. Aircraft design is an art that thumbs its nose at slide rules and mathematical projections. Know-how puts quality into an airplane, and mass production makes airplanes in quantity. Today, America's pioneering aircraft makers are sharing their know-how with other wizards of mass production, men with a genius for turning out anything from pianos to planes in thousands instead of tens. Lockheed and Vega are proud to be members of this pioneering band of aircraft makers that leads the world in creative ability and design. Proud to have know-how that even now works to perfect still greater planes for tomorrow. While their warcraft of today serve in the battle forces of the United Nations. Well, our time's up now. Next week, we're going to tell you one of the biggest stories of the war. The story of army transport. Please listen. Until then, good night, Americans. Good night.